Thank you for tuning into this teaching. We hope this message blesses you. Our mission as Marigold Church is to do anything and everything so that anyone and everyone can encounter the real Jesus. We hope as you listen to this, you encounter the real Jesus. Let him transform your mind, transform your heart, and encounter you today. If I could, I would like to kind of do an overview, kind of like a, a review, I guess, of, of what we've gone over. But I encourage you to read the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the very, the history of the beginning of the church, God's church. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 38, it says this, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, now that we believe, what shall we do? That part in parentheses, now that we believe, is something I add. They're asking this question because they believe. They believe what they've heard. I want you to go back and read Acts chapter 2. They, you, they've, they've heard the apostle Peter speaking, and now they believe it. So their question is, what shall we do? So now that we believe it, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we get this order. Believe, repent, be baptized in water, and then be baptized in the Spirit. Now, the purpose of this message was not necessarily to, I'm not necessarily to try to give new revelation or, man, this is some new thing that nobody knows. I don't believe in that. I believe the scripture is very clear in what the Bible teaches. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's my job to underline it or maybe to highlight it for you. And, and the idea is that sometimes we know something, but we don't know why we know it. And so someone comes asking questions, and if you don't have the answers... What it does, and I'm not saying you have to have every single answer, but you got to have a reasoning behind why you believe what you believe. I heard a preacher say recently that the churches are full of people, especially, especially young churches that are really thriving and blowing up, and, and they attract young people and new believers. And the churches are full of young people who are full of love for a God they do not know. And I, and I think it's important that we love God, but we've got to know him. You know, I love my parents, but it makes it even more stronger that I know them, that I know what they like and don't like. I know what their, their wants are, their desires are, their past is. I know what their future is. I, I know them. And so it, it, it goes a long way. And it's, and it's not to argue semantics. When I talk about the order of salvation, I'm not talking about semantics. And I'm not talking, well, this preacher said it this way and, and that preacher, that, that's, that's irrelevant. What I'm, what I'm talking about is we've called this a healthy spiritual birth. What we want is people to understand, I didn't do it in this order, personally. And because it didn't come in an orderly fashion, I had to go back and re-understand and re-kind of like, oh, so that's what I did. I didn't understand what it was when I got water baptized. I just like knew I was dripping wet and it was cool and a bunch of people were clapping. That was it. That was the, and, and I was excited about it. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit didn't show up because he did. But I didn't have an understanding. And I think it's important that we have a full understanding and there are precedents you know I, I i put water baptism before spirit baptism there is precedence in the scripture uh where where the spirit baptism came before the water baptism so i'm not saying oh well one if one doesn't come before the, i'm not saying that i was actually spirit filled uh before i was water baptized and so i'm not saying but i'm saying what i'm talking about is a healthy spiritual like this this would be the ideal way to do it some of you were born, maybe some of you were born premature, maybe there was complications. The fact is you're here, okay? 
And now, if we could go back and redo it, you would want a healthy birth. So you don't have to have, you know, some of the complications. My, my oldest uh, begotten son, Paul, Paul Jr., he spent the first five months of his life in the hospital because his birth wasn't normal. He was born premature. He weighed two and a half pounds. And, and so he had to spend, the, he wasn't fully developed. His intestines were not fully developed. He had to spend the first five months of his life in, in, in the NICU, which is like the newborn intensive care. And so my, my, I don't want you to be in a, a spiritual NICU. I don't want you to be in, you know, there's a lot of people I'll come across and I say, you know, how, wow, you go to church. I, I had no idea how long you've been going to church. I, oh, man, I've been a believer for 10 years. Now, there's a difference between being a believer and growing over a 10 year period and being a one year old baby Christian for 10 years. You know, you can be a, a one year old 10 times. Instead of being a 10-year-old going through the process of growing 10 years. And, and I think it's important that when the healthier your birth or even the understanding, even if that means you're, you're hearing the message and you're like, wow, I need to go back and, and get this straightened up. Wow, wow I, everyone told me about salvation. Nobody told me about repentance. So I loved Jesus, but I kept loving sin too. Man, that's, that's a hell of a life. Literally, one foot in, one foot out, man, you're split down the middle. And, and, it's, and it's unhealthy, and it's, and it's staggering to your growth. And so that's what we're doing. Now, it all starts in creation. Why were you created? It all goes back to creation. If you don't understand why you were created in the first place, you'll never truly understand what, why you need salvation or what you're being saved from or what you're being saved to. The, the easiest way to put it is this. Jesus, God already had angels, okay? He had angels. He had servants. He, had all, he did not need more servants. That's not what we were born for. We were born to be family, his family. So God had a son named Jesus, loved his son, said, I would love some more children. I'm going to create us. Okay, he creates us in his image. We're after his image. He creates us to be his children. But then there's an interruption in that, and it's called sin. And anytime sin comes into your life, it pulls you away from sonship or being a child of God. And, it, and, and when we bow over to that, we actually become children of Satan. There is no such thing as in between. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. And some act out on it. Okay? But it's this rebellion in our hearts because it, this sin is a rebellion against our creator. It's a rebellion against the one who created us to be a father over us. And when we rebel against him, what does he do? Oh, it's okay. Boys will be boys. No, you cannot be a part of this family because the, 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 the family is built on holiness and righteousness. I, I love my kids. Some of them have done some really wrong things. We have seven kids. There are some of my kids that are excommunicated from me because they would rather live the life they've chosen, which is a sinful life, now, my door is always open to them. If they are willing to come in and repent and say, you know what? I'm out living crazyville. I need, to, I, need, I need a father in my life. But at the point where they're adults and they say, I got this on my own. Guess what? The door is shut behind them. You don't get to go live that crazy life and bring it into the house. It's the same way. You don't get to live a crazy life and bring it into the kingdom of God. You're either in the kingdom or you're not. There was a, a, a man that uh, I, I was read, reading a story in a, in a book I've been reading. And, and this guy, he says, uh, he has kind of a, a disagreement with his pastor. His pastor's preaching on original sin. Original sin, it, uh, if you're not aware what the terminology says, Adam sinned. 
And therefore, it introduced sin into the entire bloodline of every human being. So when we are born, we are born into sin. So right off the bat, we're born. It's not like, oh, you get to be a, a certain age and then you misbehave and now you're... No, you're born already condemned. You're born into damnation, basically. And so this guy says, I just don't see that. I don't believe it. And, uh, and, and him and the pastor kind of would go back and forth. And pastor could not convince him. He says, we'll just have to agree to disagree. So this man gets married. And this man gets married. And, uh, and after they get married, they move away. They move to another state. And so uh, 20 years later, the man actually moves back. He moves back for work. He comes back to the church. The pastor's excited to see him and everything else. And, and they're, they're kind of rekindling their, their friendship or their acquaintanceship. And, and, and the man tells the pastor, Pastor, you'll never believe it. That you, you remember we, had, we used to have that disagreement 20 years ago about original sin? He said, yes, and, and he, says, he, says, he says, let me tell you, not only do I believe in original sin, but now I want, I, I want you to know that I believe in original sin and demon possession. And he's like, whoa, like, wow, that's a, that's a huge turnaround. He said, what convinced you? And the man turned around and said, hey, let me introduce you to my teenage boys. And... Uh, that's just a joke, but, <laughs> but uh, if you, you know, you understand kids and, and if you've raised kids, you understand like, you know, how sweet they are when they're first, first born and they're so cute. In fact, this morning we went to our granddaughter's uh, baby dedication. She's about to be one. And so she was uh, dedicated this morning and she's so sweet and cute and rebellious in her heart. Okay. Now it's not showing completely yet. But it's there, and if you're a parent, you know it's there. And uh, uh, maybe not the, the whole demon possession, but definitely the original sin. So we've been created for a purpose. Our purpose is to be children, and sin takes us from that. So therefore, we need salvation. We need salvation from, the, from our destiny of where sin takes us. When we are no longer useful for what we were created for, there's only one thing we were created for, and that's to be children of God. And if we are no longer useful for that, we are trash. We are condemned to be trashed. Now, there is a trash pit for souls called hell. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a trash bin. It's an eternal trash bin for when God says, you know what? I created you for something, and you are no longer good for that purpose. You, a banana peel was created for a purpose, to cover the banana. Once you peel it, you eat the inside, the peel has lost its purpose. So what do we do with it? We throw it away. There is no one sent to hell. They are thrown there because they are useless for what they're created for. And it sounds really harsh, but when you realize the rebellion in man's heart, you realize they don't want to be in heaven. And you can, you can decide, but he gives you the decision. And so we talked about salvation. We talked about how you're born into damnation. But God, through his penalty, paying our penalty on the cross, gives us the opportunity for justification. That is, I've been saved. I've been saved from my past sins. This is a past thing. Then we talked about uh, sanctification. So there's damnation, but we step into justification. Justification is, uh, or, or let me see, damnation is I still owe the penalty. I have to pay the penalty for my sin. The penalty for sin is eternal death. Eternal death. The justification is that I've been saved from that penalty, okay? I've been saved from the penalty of death. I've been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is now I'm being saved from the power of sin. I'm being saved from the power of sin. 
when you sin, sin has a power over you. Do you know that the only sin that has the power over you is the sin that you commit? And sin does not exist outside of man. Evil does not exist outside of men. You don't just walk one day and then fall in some sin. Like, oh my gosh, it was just a puddle. I tripped and there it was. Someone left a glass of evil on the desk and I drank it. Oh my gosh. No, it, it, it is something that is birthed inside your heart, this heart of rebellion. And as you sin, that, that sin has power over you, whatever that sin is. And as you're being sanctified and set apart, that sin has less and less power over you. You repent of it. You move from it, okay? You get away from it. That is sanctification. You're being saved from the power of sin. And one day when Christ returns, we will be glorified. And that is glorification. That is where we are saved from the very presence of sin. Now, then we talked about the four steps. Believing. Believing. Believing in. Not just believing that. Be there's a lot of people who will be in church next Sunday for Easter and they'll believe that Jesus died on the cross. They'll believe that Christ was a good person. They'll believe that he healed people and helped old ladies cross the street. They'll believe all that. That means nothing if they don't believe in him. It's one thing to believe that Jesus died on the cross. It's another thing to believe in the Christ who died on the cross, not for anything else, but for your sin, for my sin. It's a personal thing. It's a, it's a historical thing. It's not something that it's not just like, well, I believe it by this random. No, 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 no. There is so much history to Christianity. It's all there. And it's not just what we it's not just believing something. You know, it's not just enough to believe. There's a lot of different faiths out there. There's the faith of uh, Islam. There's the faith of Buddhism. There's the faith of Catholicism. But there's only one faith that says no, that, that's in Christ and Christ alone and what he did on the cross. And that is Christianity. It's not an ism. It's a Christianity. It's it's. I am in Christ. I, and it's not just about having faith. It's about what you have faith in. If I have faith in thin ice and I decide to walk across the thin ice, it doesn't matter how much faith I have in the thin ice. I'm going to fall through it. It will not hold me up. That is not a firm foundation to build my life on. So no matter how much, man, Paul has great faith in thin ice. Paul is going to be in trouble. There I find atheists. I find people in, in, in other religions that have tremendous faith. That are more dedicated to their faith than most Christians that I know. But it will do them no good. Because they have their faith in something that just doesn't work. It's not right. It's not what God has ordained. So it's not just enough to have faith. It's what you have faith in. Next, we talked about repentance. To repent is to think. And then to think again. To think the way you think. And then realize, wait a minute. My thinking is what gets me into trouble all the time. My thinking is, it, it doesn't work. I've tried it enough to know my thinking doesn't work. And so then I'm going to think again, but I'm going to think in the way God thinks. I'm going to think from his point of view, from his perspective. I used to think that certain sins were not a big deal. Therefore, I did them. Now I had to rethink, wait a minute, Maybe that sin is a big deal because God says it's a big deal. I need to think the way he thinks. If I want his results, I need his thinking. And so then I have to rethink. Wait a minute. 
I'm not just sinning like, oh, everybody sins. It's not a big. No, I am violating my Savior. I am violating the very one that I call Lord. And therefore, I am, in, you know, I, I am in need of his mercy because I'm deserving of his wrath because I have sinned. And when I sin, David clear, clearly says this in Psalm 51, I have sinned. And when I have sinned, I sinned against you, God, and you alone. When we sin, we sin against him and him alone. After that, I believe in it, you, you show actions of, of repentance Repentance is not just in your head. It's something you do. It's something you, you make happen. You turn it around. It's not just, oh, I think different, but I'm going to do the same. No, you think different, and therefore, if you truly believe it, you do something different. And once I've shown that, I'm ready for baptism, water baptism. Water baptism is, is both death and life. It's a burial and a resurrection. It's a going under and a coming out. And water baptism serves two purposes. One, it's a bath. Not for your body, but for your soul. You need a deep cleansing. A couple of weeks ago, we were out here and we were power washing the sidewalks. And at first, we kind of just wet them a little bit. You know what wetting them with the water hose did? Absolutely nothing. It just wet them. But then I hooked it up to the power washer. And I power washed it and it blasted the dirt off. And you could see an immediate difference. Your conscience needs a power blasting of water. And that's what water baptism is. It is a bath to get those deep-seated, that deep-seated dirt that you've picked up along your sinful ways. But now that you've repented of it, now that, now that you're trying to put that behind it, you need a, a, a bath because you're about to go on a journey. Every time we, uh, you know, I work in construction, so I'll come home and I get, I'm, I'm, I'm dirty, I'm sweaty or whatever. And if I know we're about to go somewhere, I don't just throw new clothes on, on top of my old sweaty body. No, there is a taking off, getting washed up, and getting reclothed and ready for the journey ahead, whether that's going out to dinner or going on a trip or whatever that is, it's a bath. Your conscience needs a bath. A, a, a guilty conscience will stifle a God confidence in you. And so you need to move forward clean washed up, ready to go. So it's a bath, but it's also a burial. When we lose someone that we've been uh, uh, in touch with and, and maybe it's a, uh, a, a, someone we've been around for a long time, a good friend, uh, uh, an acquaintance, whatever that is, there's something about a burial. It's a fi it, there's something final about it. You know, you'll go to a viewing, you'll go to certain things and, and all these things. But when you see them go in the ground, it's very final. It's very final. And so what we, what we need to do is finalize the death of the old us. If I'm going to follow Christ in a new life, I need to bury the old one. As much as I was attached to my sin and my old lifestyle, there came a point where I had to bury it and say no more. If you try to hold on to it, it just creates turmoil in your walk. If you're trying to, to, to carry this dead life with you throughout your, throughout your walk, it, it's, it's a dead weight on you. And sometimes it's the hardest thing to do. Especially when it's even if if you've been in a relationship with someone and, and maybe it was not a healthy relationship. Maybe it's not even someone you like, but you were just around them all the time. There's still something very moving about when they when they're put in the ground. You start thinking about all the the good things. And we can do that with our sinful life. 
We can start thinking about, man, we used to have a good time together. Man, we used to go to clubbing. Man, me and my, me and my old body, we used, to, we used to do this. We used to go here. We used to... Man, it's time to bury that thing away. You got to bury it and put it away and move on. Now, today, we're talking about receiving the Spirit of God, receiving the Holy Spirit. And there's a, there's a putting off. So that's why I say there's, there's a healthy order to it. I encourage you, if, if there's anything that any of these that, that haven't been taking place, maybe you're saying, you know what, I haven't been baptized. I need that. And get it done. And get it done. And we'll be having baptisms in the, in the month of April. So we'll be doing that here in a couple of weeks, a few weeks. And if, and if there's something that needs to be repented of in the meantime, get it done. Get it done. And you, what you want to do is when the Holy Spirit comes, you want to be ready. Okay? Because, and we'll talk about why that is in, in, in just a little bit. For time's sake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to skip a couple of, of verses, uh, Rebecca. Rebecca's uh, my daughter. She's in the sixth grade. And you never see her because she's up there in the in the in the in the loft up there doing the doing the slides. We were actually having having trouble with the slides earlier, so it, that wasn't her fault. There was a, a little glitch in the system, and I went up there and I was scared to click on anything because I have a way of uh, uh, clicking self destruct buttons or something on on computers. So. We're both just looking at it, and I'm, like, moving the mouse around. And uh, thank you, Benji, for going up there, making sure that was, that was where it needed to be. But uh, if you would, we talked about last week, we, we covered uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 3 through 14. And, and, and he talks about, this is John the Baptist, and he's talking about a baptism in water. But just for time's sake, we're going to skip that. I encourage you to go back and read Luke chapter 3. Uh, and, and, and or go back and listen to the message last week. And, but we're going to skip to Luke chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. It says, Now while the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. I want to go back to that part where he says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There are two Baptists or baptizers in the New Testament. One is John. John baptized. He's called John the Baptist or John the Baptizer or John the Dunker. And, and that's basically what it means is he's the one that dunked people and he dunked them in a dirty water of the Jordan River, but he dunked them and he, and he got their soul washed up. And so... What he did was he baptized people with water. But he says, wait a minute, there's going to be one greater than me, and he'll baptize you in the Spirit and with fire. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus was baptized, we see that Jesus was baptized. Now, did he need a, a, a cleansing of his conscience? No. He was showing us something. He had a clear conscience, never sinned in his life. But he says he, he, he was baptized out of this obedience and, he, and he's baptized. It says the Holy Spirit ascended on him or descended on him like a dove. It was not a dove that came and landed on his shoulder. What it was, it was the Holy Spirit coming down upon him like a dove. And this shows how the, how the Spirit moves. The Holy Spirit does not fall on you in the sense of like just wreck man knocking you down and 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 getting into weird man some people start barking like dogs and flapping like chickens okay that is not the holy spirit it says like a dove he came on them gently the holy spirit is talking about a, a, the whisper of the holy spirit now don't get me wrong the holy spirit is a powerful force but he does not come on you in a way that he makes you do anything 
You receive him. You ever seen a, a, a bird or a, a, a dove? You know, we used to go to the zoo a lot and they would do the little animals and, you know, how they land on you. And the hawks come and they've got to be fully garbed in this, you know, uh, leather apron and leather thing. And, you know, they're like, they've got some 10-year-old kid. All right, come put this on and let this hawk climb on you. And the hawk's just, you know, just clinking into the, into the leather and the kid's scared to death. And, and, and then you see just, and then you, they'll go to the other beautiful little cages or just there's pigeons around and there's doves around in the, in the zoo or whatever. And they're just a lot more gentle. Now a pigeon is a messy animal and they just kind of crash land everywhere. If you've ever seen a pigeon land, but, but a dove, the, the way they hover over before landing. Uh, and, and those, those of you who go dove hunting, you, you know what that is. And, and, uh, so as soon as they take off, you blast them, right? But that's not what we're talking about. All right, so, but what is spirit baptism? Spirit baptism is, it's, it's receiving the spirit. And the reason I spent so much time last week on, on, on trying to understand or, or, or teaching on the water baptism is water baptism is not a symbol of the spirit. It's not a, it's not a symbol of the, the spirit baptism, but it is a foreshadowing. And, and the more you understand about water baptism, the more you'll understand about spirit baptism. Because we talked about water baptism would be uh, very similar. Like if you're on the 4th of July, you got a big tank of, uh, you know, a big bowl of Kool-Aid or a punch bowl or something. And you have that cup. You, you know the cup. The cup that you use to fill the other cups. And so what do you do? You dunk it in. You dunk it. You submerse it. You immerse it in, in the punch and it comes out and it's fully wet, but it's full in the inside. And that is what you use to transfer the punch over into the other cups. And, and you do that, but there's a filling. There's a filling that takes place. We see John the Bapt Baptist did water baptism. Jesus did spirit baptism. He is the one that baptizes us. It is he himself who shows up in our lives to baptize us. We see parallels in, in the scripture where we, where we see the words living water. We, we see uh, falling upon or coming upon. But in this, in this way of, uh, of, a, of a, uh, you know, just being overtaken with the water in a, in a sense of you're being completely covered. You also see the words filled with and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you know when you're filled or overflowing. How do you know when you're full of the Holy Spirit? You know that you can know when you're full of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and equally importantly, you can know when you're not full of the Holy Spirit. We talked about it last week. Water baptism is a one-time thing. Right? You're water baptized. You get dunked once. It's not, oh man, I sinned, I need to get dunked again. No, you need to confess that sin because we see where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. They didn't need to get dunked again. They just needed to be washed up a little bit. Because when we're walking in, in our walk with the Lord, what, we're going to pick up some dirt along the way because we're called to go out into the world. Evangelism should happen outside the walls of the church. Not inside. Don't bring people in to get them saved. Go get them saved and then bring them in and say, You'd, this, this is where you get cleaned up. So you can be an evangelist. You, all you got to do is tell your story. I used to be this, now I'm this. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You don't got to know all the scriptures. All you got to know is you and what God did in you. So water baptism happens once. Spirit baptism has, happens once. He only dunks you once, but he'll keep filling you. Why? Because your idea is just like that spout or just like, you know, you're, you're, you're letting out the spirit. You're, you're putting out the spirit on people. You're letting it out. And at the end of the day, you may come up empty and you need to get refilled. How do you know when you're filled and how do you know when you're empty? It's based on what comes out of your mouth. The other day I was putting gas and I went to a like a like kind of like a mom and pop place, and you know usually I'll go to like a, a a big chain thing, and 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 I just happened to be I was kind of low in gas, and I was like, well, you know what, I got I I got about 20 minutes before I got to be at a meeting, 
let me just gas up real quick, and then the meeting's right down the road. So I, I stopped, I gassed up. Well, their little, the little thing, I, I, you know, when you're doing the pump and you click it, and then you get on your phone and scroll for 10 minutes or whatever. And so, and so I'm doing that, and then I hear, Whoosh! well, the little thing didn't click when it was full. And so it was overflowing. It was the, the, the gas was spouting out the side of my truck. It was overflowing. You have a spout like that, and it's called your mouth. And whatever, is, whatever you are filled with to overflowing, it will overflow out of your mouth. If you're overflowing with, with fear, it's going to come out of your mouth. If you're overflowing with faith, with peace, with joy, it will overflow out of your mouth. If you're filled with anger, it will come out of your mouth. We can know what we're filled with by what's coming out of our mouth. I knew that my, my truck was full of gas because that's what was coming out. If whipped cream started coming out, that means I'd done something completely terribly wrong and someone else had too. But that's, it was coming, whatever it was filled with is what was coming out. I want to look at the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are are mentioned several times in the scripture and in, in the Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, 1 Peter. But we're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 11. And I'm going to read this real quick. And there's nine gifts mentioned here. Nine gifts. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And so these are all gifts of the spirit. So the, the gifts are different, but the gift giver is the same. The source is the same. And they are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the, by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, and to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works in all these, distributing to each one individually as he wills. I want you to see something. There's nine mentioned there. Five out of those nine, so a little more than half, have to do with your mouth. The word of wisdom, to be able to speak wisdom, wisdom that you didn't have. It's not, it's not from you. It's not head wisdom. It's not man's wisdom. It's God's wisdom. There's a common sense that sometimes we as, as, as people think we're too above that little thing and God will speak it through us. Have you ever someone ever come to you with an issue and you didn't you don't understand all of a sudden you start speaking to the issue and you're like whoa where'd that come from now they're telling you how smart you are and you know you're not that smart but man it, the word of wisdom worked out worked work through you. the word of knowledge to know something and to speak it out this is this is one of the more Usually people are, are scared of that one, and it's usually the scarier part is, is, is uh, the one receiving the word, but to call something out in someone. And, and that, can be, that can be on the positive. I'm calling out something that you didn't know was there, but it's there in a, in a positive way. God's, God's dropped something in you that you didn't know, know what was there. I know that was done with Marcus where they spoke over him. Uh, this musical talent that he did not have at the time. I've heard the videos. And there was no, there was, that was a definite word of knowledge. And, uh, but, but you, you see him now today. And, uh, and there's a reason he's not going to have the microphone the rest of the night. And so, and so he, might, he might start saying something about me. And, so, uh, and then another one, prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is to, is to speak the word of God. But in a way that it's an overflowing. You begin to declare the word. In an authority that you didn't know you had. 
It comes from you. It's not just, it's not just a, a, a human authority over another human. It's the word of God coming through you. That is prophecy. A lot of times we look at prophecy as like, yeah, the, the God's coming in three years. That's prophecy. No, okay? Most of that is heresy, okay? That, it's speaking the word of God. And, and if it's prophecy and it's, and it's, it's done by the, by the spirit of God, and which is the only true prophecy, it'll come to pass. I've been prophesied over things that I never thought. Uh, the fact that people call me pastor was prophesied over me many, many years by a man that I did not like. And his name was David Casanova. And David Casanova has passed on to be with the Lord, but I did not like David. And he knew I did not like him. And he was an older gentleman. I was a teenager. And he one day I mouthed off to him. And I was ready for him to mouth off to me so I could go tell on him. And instead, he says, he looked at me and pointed me square in the eye like he was piercing his little, or I say little, he had hands about the size of my, my, both of my feet put together. But he, he pointed at me, he was a big gentleman. He says, one day, one day you're going to be a teacher and people all over the world are going to hear your, or hear your voice. It hasn't happened yet. But we're well on the way. That's prophecy. He's speaking things. It's a word of knowledge. It's a word of wisdom. And tongues. This is one of the ones that, that usually people get into quackyville about and, uh, and, and start doing weird things and goofy things. And they hear the word tongues. And the teenagers get excited about it because, ooh, anything with a tongue is exciting when you're a teenager. Uh, but, but this is the gift of tongues. It's languages. Languages, you begin to speak languages, you didn't, it's, it's flowing through you. you. You begin to speak in a tongue that you didn't know and it's praises of God. Tongues and, and prophecy are very, are very much the same because when, you're, when, you're, when, you, when you speak in tongues or when you speak in this different language, you're speaking God's word. It's just a matter of is it in the language that you know, which is prophecy? If you know the language and you're speaking it, that's prophecy. And then there's, there's the gifts of tongues or the gifts of languages, which would be something you don't know. And then there's interpretation of tongues. And I, I, I skipped some gifts in there. I'm just going over the ones that have to do with your mouth. The interpretation of tongues. That's to, to hear a language that you don't know and to know exactly what they're saying. That's that interpretation of languages. To, to hear a language that you don't know and to be able to say, I know exactly what they're saying. God's given me, given me that thing. And, and that's something that it's, and there's an order to it. God, remember, God is a God of grace, mercy, love, joy, peace. But God is a God of order. He, that is his lordship. He is a God of order. He's a father and he's a good father. And any good father will keep order in his house. So we see that there's something that comes out. Now, what will flow out of my mouth? We just talked about those things. Languages. Languages. You know, there's over 6,500 languages on earth today that are currently spoken. 6,500. And there's not a single one that God doesn't know. And, there, and, and, and who knows how many in heaven. And then I, I know I was reading the other day just as I was studying. And there's many languages that have gone uh, by the wayside that no one speaks anymore. Um, it can be an outburst of praise. An outburst of praise. You don't, it's just, it's a shout. It, I, mean, it, I mean, just like, you, you, you know what that is because... If, if you've ever been to a sports game or whatever, and you, is someone, you know, that, that I'm a baseball guy, so that guy hits a home run, and you're like, yes! Man, you jump out of your seat, your hands go up. It's, but this is something, it's so much stronger, because it's, it's this, you realize what God is doing something in you, and, it's, and you can't contain it, it's got to come out. Sometimes it can be a, a shout of, of, of hallelujah, praise, thank you, Jesus. What, it could be just a yes or a yes or whatever. But it's a shout. It's, a, it's an outburst of praise. And it can be an outburst of prophecy. But there's something that moves. We see when, 
when Mary, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth and, and they're both pregnant and, and Mary begins to, to, we call it the Magnificat, I think, Magnificat. But uh, she begins to speak and prophesy and give praise. Now, filled is uh, baptized as being dunked, but filled as being filled. Now, here's the thing. You can believe and not be filled. You can believe and not be filled. Because you, it's something you receive. If, if, if you send me a gift to my door... And, and I, I have the opportunity to reject it. FedEx comes to my door, UPS, USPS, whoever it is, they come to my door. I can reject. I can reject whatever you've sent or I can receive it. It's up to me. God does not force anything on you. Okay? And so there's got to be an overflow. There's an overflow when you have received it. And you can know when you've received it and you can know when you haven't received it. You know, the apostles, if you look through the, the, the New Testament, it was almost an expectation. And l- let me tell you, you can go through life with the Spirit upon you, but that's not the same as having the Spirit within you. There is a difference. Okay? It, it, if you don't believe me, there's a, you know, there's a difference. When you leave today of getting in your car to go home and getting on your car, to go home. Okay? There is a difference. Now you still may get where you want to go, but if you're on the hood of your car, you'll probably get banged up along the way. You may fall off. You're you're bound to swallow a few bugs that you weren't planning on. So there's a difference between being on and being in. The Holy Spirit wants to be in you. And, and he can do things when he's upon you. We see that all through the, all through the Old Testament. Where, where uh, you know, Samson, you have people like David. You have, those people did not have the spirit in them. They had the spirit upon them. But you and I, we have the opportunity to have the spirit within us. And that's, that's the great difference. That's the great difference. And there is an assurance that comes with it. Let me tell you. If you, the Spirit is living within you, there is an assurance that comes with that. You know, there's signs, there's wonders, there, there's things like that. And we don't seek after signs. In a, in, in a short time, there's going to be a, a thing for here, for, uh, not here, but uh, we're, y'all are doing it. And, and Kyle, um, for some of the ladies, and, and, the, and, and the ladies have already kind of booked that up, those that are going. And... And it's our first thing that we've done together for the ladies. We'll be doing something for the men here pretty soon because men need man time. And, uh, and we're going to do that together. But, 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 but the ladies, they're, they're, they're getting together. And, and as they're driving to the place, they're going to see signs along the way. They're not seeking the sign. They, because when they see the sign that says Kyle, that doesn't mean that's what, yes, we're here. We've reached the sign. No, they're going to go be staying at a, at a, at a place with acreage, and, and it's a really nice place. And the, but seeing the signs along the way lets them, gives them an assurance that they're headed in the right direction. You and I can have an assurance. And that's what the Spirit within us is all about. It's giving us this assurance. You know that you're in Him when He's in you. So many times we talk just about having Jesus in your heart. Jesus in your heart. I want Jesus in my heart. That is so small. And the only way that you truly know that he's in you is if you're in him. And if you're not in him, you'll be cut off from him. There's, no, there's, there's really no getting around that. And, and sometimes that sounds really harsh and but along, along the journey, we, we want to see the signs, but the signs are just letting us know we're headed in the right direction. That is our assurance. I'm horrible with directions. I'm horrible with direction. And so I need to know landmarks. I need to know, like, all right, you're going to turn, you know, there's going to be a fire hydrant, and there may be a dog peeing on it. If so, that's the one. You take a ride. That, I, need, like, I need to see signs and objects and wonders, and, you know, I need to see stuff because if you just tell me an address, and, yeah, I remember we went there like three times last week. I still don't know where I'm at. I, 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 need, to, I need the roadmap. 
And the Holy Spirit can give us this roadmap and we'll see signs along the way. And when we see the certain signs, we'll know we're headed in the right direction. The idea that you can turn whichever way in life and still get to the direction, it doesn't work in your regular life, in your car, and it doesn't work spiritually. You can't just say one day, uh, one, I believed in Jesus and now I'm on my way to heaven. You, you need to check the signs along the way. Check the signs. Okay? And, and so I, I encourage you to do that. But you can have assurance. All right? It doesn't mean that you're never going to make a mistake. It doesn't mean that you won't sin again. But, the, but the, the, on the journey to sinlessness, what is it? You sin less. Okay, and, that, and that's a sign in itself. You, you, you begin to see yourself, wow, I, I, man, I stubbed my toe. I used, to, I used to say this, this, and this. This time I just said, ouch. That's a sign. Man, I'm getting cleaned up. This is a good sign. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise. You're working in me. There are signs along the way. And we can, have, we can have this assurance. We don't have to doubt. You don't have to wonder if you're going to heaven. And, and heaven is really not the destination anyway. Heaven, heaven is just, heaven is just a, like, kind of like the bonus. The, the, the true destination is, is, is we're living it as sons and daughters of Christ. And one day we get to, we, we're finally going to be home together. This old earth and, and, and this, old, this old heavens and everything, all, all that we see is going gonna, gonna to gonna pass away and we'll, we'll finally get to have a, a, a new place. What is he doing? He's getting us cleaned up and prepared for eternity. You don't want to just be a big fat baby on, with a harp on a cloud. Like what's, what's the fun in that? You've been given purpose. And, 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 and the whole idea of coming to church and, and hearing the word of God is to prepare yourself for that purpose. I'm, I'm not going to, usually I'll do a, a question and answer, um, but I'm not going to do that today for the sake of time. But uh, I do want to pray us out and I want to pray and then and Jen is going to close us out. But, uh, and then, well, actually I'll stay up here because I, I want to give a couple of announcements with you. Is that okay? All right. Well, Lord, I thank you. First of all, Father, I thank you for your presence. Lord, as, as, as in the weeks to come, I, I just ask that you would speak to us. If there's anything that we've missed on this journey, if, if we haven't been water baptized, and, and, and Lord, I, just, I, I thank you, Lord God, that you would just convict us and show us what sins need to be dealt with. I thank you, Lord God, that on the, on the way, you convict us of our sin. You, we confess our sin. And then we correct it. I thank you, Lord God, as we're baptized in water, Father God, Lord, that you would also baptize us in your spirit. That we would be given the gifts, every single gift, and as, they, as you would just fill us with your spirit. Lord, that it would, it would show by the overflow of our mouth and the overflow of our actions in our lives. I thank you, Father, for your patience over us. And we thank you, Lord God, just for this Palm Sunday. Lord, so, so long ago, you, you, you rode into your kingdom. Or you, you rode into Jerusalem and, and, and people shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna means save us, save us now. And Lord, at that time, they thought you were establishing the, a kingdom of David, but Father, you were establishing God's kingdom. And we thank you, Lord God, that we are able to be a part of your kingdom. That we, we have the, this kingdom, which is the power of God. The kingdom is not just a place and it's not just a people. It's your very power. And it's your power living in us. I thank you, Lord God, that as you baptize us in the spirit, as, we, as we've received you, we believe in you, we repent, we're water baptized, and we receive you, Father, that you don't let us down. We will not be put to shame because you are a good God. And when we ask you something, Father God, you don't trick us. You give us exactly a good thing because you're a good God. 
You're a good father. You're a good Lord. You know what's best for us, and that is what you give us. You give us only good things. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey, if this message or any of the content that we've been putting out has blessed you and you're wondering how you can partner with us in generosity, there are a couple ways to do that. You can download the PushPay app and you can search Marigold Church and you can give that way. You could also set up reoccurring giving and it's really user-friendly. It makes it really easy to give. You could also text Marigold to 77977 and give that way. We believe God moves through a generous heart. And so we would love to see what God does through you as you partner with us and as we walk through this journey together.